welcome to epg parashala the paper that we are discussing now is 20th century english literature and the module is on war poets we will be looking at three war poets they are wilfred owen siegfried sassoon and rupert brooke let's have an introduction to war poetry war poetry is poetry written during and about the first world war the first world war as we all know was also called the great war war poetry is also known as trench poetry it's a kind of modern poetry which is naturalistic and at the same time painfully realistic we said it's a kind of modern poetry there must be some reason for it some of these uh, poets that we will be seeing they all were influenced by georgian poetry some of them were romantics at heart now they were writing during the modern period during the early part of the 20th century now uh, if we look for modernist traits in their poetry you one may not find it because this these poets were writing uh, in response to something traumatic that happened in europe it was a great war when you look at the war poets and the kind of poetry they were writing you would see that it is not at all like the poetry that was being written at that time georgian poetry so it is set in contrast with georgian poetry rupert brooke for example did write poetry in that manner we need to think about the tradition that we are familiar with when poets did write about war there were poets who believed or who wrote about war and presented war as something very noble that it was a noble affair that that involved kings and kingdoms and the royalty the soldiers the warriors were celebrated so you have the idea of the happy warrior a person who was ready to give his life for the country there are other words for it now this is the happy warrior let us say is a kind of euphemism but then in plain speech it might be called jingoism my country right or wrong now this was the attitude that was there and war poetry punctures that it raises certain basic questions about this this is what war poetry did war poetry in that sense was anti war poetry and it represented the horror and the pity of war it dealt with shocking images and language in fact war poetry gave a whole lot of words to language it could be english it could be any other language for that matter certainly it did contribute a lot to the english language a word like we talked about trench poetry a word like trench is a contribution of war there are other things that these poets talked about or these poems talked about these poems would have or have images of mud trenches the stink of death the total havoc caused by war now we will look at some famous war poets there are quite a few of them we will list out some names rupert brooke is one wilfred owen siegfried sassoon and isaac rosenberg richard aldington edmund blunden robert graves julian grenfell ivor gurney david jones robert nichols herbert reed charles hamilton sorley and of course edward thomas among all these poets rupert brooke represented the ideal of patriotic and noble sacrifice of war this is a poet who wrote about war before the first world war poets like wilfred owen or sassoon and rosenberg they captured the terror and the tragedy of modern warfare all these were soldier poets now these soldier poets were bound together by their first hand experience of war 
because most of them had participated in the great war so it was all uh, all these people coming together and then there was a friendship that they cultivated in the trenches right there on the battlefield so it was this that really uh, they they shared a lot of things they shared the words that they were trying to uh, to write down they read each other's works now there are instances of that which we will be looking at so uh, there was this great um, friendship perhaps and then there was this uh, the, this person, the feelings that they had which they tried to communicate catherine rayley catherine rayley's 1978 bibliography bibliography of english poetry of the first world war has listed about 3000 war poems by over 2225 poets war poets who wrote about the war now that is an amazing thing now we will look at rupert brook rupert brook established the cult of the soldier poet in england He was the pioneer of war poetry who started off as I said earlier in the Georgian line before we go any further there's something that I would like to read to you this is very interesting now the soldier poets we mentioned the soldier poets the soldier poets were all bound together by their first hand experience as I said of not just the war of modern industrial warfare because the with the first world war you could see the active intervention of technology now one thing that happens with all these wars the wars that are fought these days is that you do not see your enemy directly there's a great distance that separates you so it's here that the cult of the soldier poet becomes very very interesting now what did we have when we talk about the intervention of technology in war this is a question that we have to ask these wars then led to superhuman inhumanities it led to immemorial shames now there is a poem that refers to this it's a poem by wilfred owen there are three or four lines from spring offensive that's there in your e text and you might want to take a look at the e text to read those four lines by wilfred owen i would urge you to read it rupert brook to come back to rupert brook he was as i said a pioneer of war poetry now what brook's poetry at that point was doing was to present a symbol of a mythical pre war golden age so this is the soldier poet the nobility of the soldier the fact that you fight for a, a noble or a royal cause so it was the golden age and therefore we find that his poetry suffused with patriotism it was graceful it was lyrical now patriotism is something that we always associate with the army with the soldier we are using the word soldier again and again but we are not talking about we did not use the word army we do not use the word the military but it's always the soldier and the soldier poet i was talking about all this because we come across the word patriotism now who is a patriot now what comes to mind here is the way in which a certain missile in the late part of the 20th century was named the patriot missile which is not at all poetic but then you have brooks poetry brimming with patriotism now what are the major works he has written war sonnets and there's one particular poem in that war sonnets that's very very famous so we will try and perhaps read at least a couple of lines from that he did live in tahiti so there's this collection called tiare tahiti the great lover the old vicarage grandchester i stayed about the deck 
and then there was this collection of letters from America that came out in 1916 and then his letters, Rupert Brooke's letters came out in 1968. So that gives you some idea of the output, the creative output of Rupert Brooke. If you look for some of the famous poems that he has, we talked about those sonnets that he wrote about war. There's one particular sonnet that's very, very famous, very popular. It's called Peace. It's a very popular sonnet. It reveals Brooks's romantic vision of war. It's a vision unaffected, untouched by actual experience of war. If you have to look for a single poem about war, that's very famous, then it is The Soldier. Now, this is a great poem. We will try and see if we can read this poem before we talk about maybe another poem by Brooks. Let's look at that. On Easter Sunday in 1915, Dean Inge preached at St. Paul's and he read The Soldier. He read this poem, The Soldier, to his congregation. And this is what he said. I'll read out this quotation from him. He said, announced that, he, and this is what he announced that, the enthusiasm of a pure and elevated patriotism had never found a nobler expression. The Soldier is perhaps the only poem that contains the first person singular pronoun. I will read out maybe two or three lines from the poem. It's worth listening. The first lines probably efface the first person, but then there is something else here about this first few lines. I will just read it out to you. If I should die, think only this of me, that there is some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. What Brooke does here is dramatize the tragedy of his own possible death. We've been talking about death, the dead. This is another poem by Brooks. And this speaks about the transforming power of death in battle. We will look at another very important war poet, Wilfred Owen. Wilfred Owen is perhaps the best known of the war poets. He died young at the age of 25. He was a martyr of the First World War. Wilfred Owen had a long-lasting friendship with Siegfried Sassoon. Sassoon was elder to him. This was a long-lasting relationship. Now, when I say long-lasting, it doesn't mean that I mean, one cannot ask, now here is this poet who died very young, how can you have a long-lasting relationship? I think it has to do with the poems that they shared and what the poems did have to say about many, many young people who were participating in the war and many more who died, who were traumatized, who were shell-shocked by the war. And many of these writers were really shell-shocked and had to be hospitalized and had to come out of that. So this is what we mean by a long-lasting, deep friendship or relationship. Wilfred Owen was very much impressed by Sosun's trench sketches in his published, just published book. So there was this great respect that he had for Sosun. Wilfred Owen's poems are marked by bleak realism. They also talk to you about his indignation, his energy. He was very young, his energy, his compassion, his high technical skills. The images that you have in Owen are very dark and they were all were the result of the war front experiences that he had to undergo. There is this underworld in Wilfred Owen. You have this underworld in a poem like a strange meeting, for example. Now, this is based on uh, uh, perhaps uh, an incident where uh, he fell into this 
uh, trench and it was a descent as it were into hell so this is something there were there were these some of these experiences that wilfred owen did use in his poems many of his poems allude to the loss of innocence that comes along with your participation in war what is it that you gain when you lose innocence it's not even the innocence and experience kind of structure with which we are familiar these poems talk about allude to this loss of innocence but then there is something more something that's really really terrifying uh, in these poems it's not experience because what you have is a deep sense of disillusionment with a whole lot of things in particular organized religion that's reflected in his poems religion preaches brotherhood love for one another and yet you have all these people fighting losing limbs bloodshed and all this gore violence and perhaps this is why there was this great disillusionment with organized religion now these are some of the works of wilfred owen dulls a decorum est 1917 his complete poems and fragments were put together and published in 1983 and his letters were collected and published in 1967 i refer to this poem strange meeting now this is a poem told from the point of view of the narrator who attempts to escape the death and the thumping of guns by going down the trenches it's like a journey into the underworld and what does he see there he sees this soldier that he had killed this is a strange meeting what is it that you gain when you kill somebody in the back in a battle what do you get a poem like futility again a very important poem it does a dissection of the aftermath of war we talk about history as always something that is written by the victors and not the vanquished but then do we get to read about the futility of war the aftermath of war the futility and the aftermath of war do victors write about the aftermath of war so this is a question that we have to ask when we look at the works of wilfred owen Wilfred Owen suffered once from neurasthenia. Neurasthenia is shell shock and he was hospitalized. And um, while at the hospital his doctors advised him not to be dejected and then uh, he was asked to write and contribute to the hospital magazine. Now there um he published two of his poems. the name of the magazine was called the hydra now he published two of his poems there and there were four poems that were published by his friend sigfrid sassoon in that collection in in that magazine we we'll now look at the works of sigfrid sassoon when we think of sigfrid sassoon he probably uh, lived perhaps the longest among all these uh, writers uh he lived at least till nine, he lived till 1967 uh much after and he he lived through the cold war now when we look at sosur's poetry we would see that they had an unflinching or he used an unflinching direct direct language and style now this is what marks sosun's poetry now this is again something that influenced the poetry of wilfred owen so when we talk about owen and we talk about sassoon we cannot talk about them exclusively he is remembered best for his angry and satirical poems of the first world war sassoon's poetry evoked the soul wrenching the heart wrenching terror and brutality of trench warfare his poetry is characterized by again a bleak kind of realism there was sheer absolute contempt for war leaders and patriotic cant 
and at the same time he had a lot of compassion towards his comrades fellow soldiers with arms he wrote both war poetry and later on after the war religious poems but then we remember sasun primarily for his war poems his religious poems are not all that widely read or popular so we always try to read him as a war poet he also achieved fame as a prose writer also his early works were printed in private and they were all very slim volumes even when the war broke out some of these poems were published for about 10 years at least till 1916 these privately printed poems were published they were minor poems they were imitative there are some of these collections that is worth mentioning the old century and seven more years this is one collection the wheel of youth secret's journey john masefield was a major influence in those days and you have a very clever parody of masefield's narratives in this book the daffodil murder he has a three volume diary that were published he has also published a critical biography of the victorian novelist and poet george meredith he has a trilogy a semi autobiographical trilogy called the complete memoirs of george shurston so this gives you an idea about the 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 output the 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 creative output of sasun we look at very briefly at least indicate some of the famous sasun poems one poem that comes to mind is enemies enemies is a poem that confronts the questions and the responsibility of killing in war the question of the responsibility of killing in war another poem titled conscripts mocks the ideals of attractive attitude of the soldiers we know what conscription is you are compelled as it were to join the army so the ideals and attractive attitudes of the soldiers so this is what is interrogated in a poem like conscripts there's a third poem that comes to mind it's titled attack attack gives you facts and details of war now what it does is as it gives you these details it asks the public or the reader to accept the reality the shock of trench warfare now trench warfare is not something uh, that was very familiar or popular with people and so here is uh, this war poet trying to uh, not exactly introduce but then trying to show the trauma and the agony through which soldiers live every moment of their life as they battle it out for land or for whatever now these are some of the famous sasun poems now to conclude this the war poets have always tried to show the what happens to young people when they go and fight in the name of their nation so th- what you have here is a very trenchant critique of the way in which wars are uh, waged now the way in which these wars affect people in psychological terms now this is something that is brought out in uh, war poetry now what war poetry also does is to show how this carnage as it were this futile the, how this is a very futile exercise and how it goes against perhaps the natural world order that it ruptures the innate cycle of life and death and finally there is one more thing that needs to be kept in mind when we look at war poetry what is that these poets one can say these poets in their poems were giving us a documentary on war so it has also 
a documentary like quality and perhaps some of these poems can be read as some kind of a testimony or they can be read as even testimonials now we have not in uh, in this module we have not analyzed any particular poem in detail now i would urge you the reason is this the reason is that is to urge you to take up these poets and then read some of these poems that are that have been mentioned in the course of this lecture and then so that we will be able to think about uh, some of these concerns some of these issues that they have raised they they did raise during the great war thank you